The date is Thursday, August 17th, 1978. And Laurel and Hardy buffs from all over are merging in Chicago for the first International Sons of the Desert convention. The next few days would be filled with excitement and fun as celebrities and movie buffs alike gather to honor the greatest film comedians the world has ever known. I'm Ken Behrens, and I was one of the lucky Laurel and Hardy buffs who got to attend that get-together and interview the special guests for radio. All of the conversations you'll hear are taken from actual interviews that were heard on the air on WJBC in Bloomington, Illinois. Laurel and Hardy biographer and exhausted ruler John McCabe was there, and he talked about the Sons of the Desert and how it got its start. It was a focus for the affection that many people felt for Laurel and Hardy. After I wrote my first book, Mr. Laurel and Mr. Hardy, a lot of people wrote me expressing their deep love for Laurel and Hardy, and I became aware of the depth of that feeling, and I decided to do something about it. So I founded this group, which is a, a group of buffs uh, devoted to the films and also to the persons of Laurel and Hardy. And I drew up a, a studiedly uh, irreverent and uh, funny constitution, and we have been meeting in uh, many places. There are many chapters called tents, which meet in uh, mostly large cities, but by no means only large cities, uh, across the country and in England and Canada. Anita Garvin was a Ziegfeld showgirl. In fact, it was the Ziegfeld show Sally that brought her to Hollywood. She left the show, stayed in California, and worked in several studios, first at Al Christie's and then finally ending up at Roach and other studios where she made feature films. I asked Anita what qualities she needed as an actress to work for Hal Roach. I think that uh, he wanted talent more than anything because you do things in one take. And uh, if you weren't capable of doing it in one take, you wouldn't make the second picture. <laughs> now, Hal Roach wasn't here, of course, because his wife took ill. Right. But um, what kind of a fellow was, was he to work for? Very nice. He's very generous to everyone. I mean, he gave of his time and uh, stopped, always spoke to people, in spite of the fact that he was the big boss of the studio. He uh, gave of himself, and I think that's pretty nice. I know Stan pointed out in a couple of instances, I think when they made Swiss Miss later on, that uh, there were some disagreements. He was the kind of guy that could take input, though, wasn't he? You know, Stan was very clever about making suggestions. He'd do it in such a way that the person he was making the suggestion to would think that it was their idea. <laughs> in other words, he really directed the pictures, Stan, although the director thought that he made them. He uh, would think up the different gags, think up story ideas. You know, we didn't work with a script. It was kind of... Uh, just an idea, and we took it from then on. A, a lot of uh, uh, scenes were ad lib, and we'd just keep on going. If we felt it was funny, we just kept on working. How long did it take to make a short? Uh, well, you know, it varied. Sometimes we'd make them in two weeks, some three, four, five, even up to six weeks. Depended upon the technical part of it, if there were things like blowing up the car in Blotto. Or, it took a little time to work those things out. In that particular scene, you take a shotgun and shoot the car, and the whole car just sort of falls apart. Doors and everything in the roof fly off the car. Of course, there was stuntmen in the car. At that Stan point? And Stan and Babe weren't in the car then, naturally. Valuable property couldn't take a chance. You recall, were they ever injured in any filming incidents, or were you ever injured? Oh, I think we all had our bruises, more or less. I remember one scene that uh, the director thought was very, very funny. I was pulling, uh, supposedly my husband, he had a, uh, it was a masquerade ball, and he had a devil's costume on, and he was hiding from me under the bed, and the tail was sticking out. And I pulled on that tail to get him out from under the bed, and the tail breaks, and I fall. And the director thought it was so funny that he had us do it over and over again. I finally did hurt myself a bit. <laughs> and then they used the first take, of course. Did you find them to be funny after you worked so hard to polish a gag and get it pulled off right on film when you finally saw it? And when you look at them now, in fact, do you still think the films are funny? I laugh just as hard as anyone. 
I think they were so marvelous. They were truly great. What can I say? They were really great. I don't think there'll ever be anyone as great as Laurel and Hardy. for me to, to meet you. Well, thank you, Ken. I'm delighted to be here. It's just a pleasure to see all these wonderful people. You mentioned it's been a while since you've been in show business. It's been 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. How old were you, if I can ask, when, when you made, no, when you made I Way Out West? Way Out West. Well, that will certainly be giving my age away, won't it? Um, I must have been about 24, I think, 23 or 24. Now, isn't this crazy? I, I, I meet you and I forget. Is it Mary Richards or Mary Rogers you played? Mary Roberts. Mary Roberts? Mm -hmm who you played. You were the one that was to inherit the, the, the deed. Yes, the gold mine. And bad old James Finlayson and his Sherry counterpart, Lynn. Sherry Lynn, tried to get it away from you. That's true. <laughs> what was it like making that picture? Oh, it was just a, it was the most delightful experience of my life, really, to be with these wonderful people. They, they just, um, they were a joy. As I recall, that's one that Stan produced. Yes, he did. So he must have had a lot of say in that movie. He certainly did, and he, of course, at times the gags would come up, you know, in his mind, and they would start another scene, and he would, they would do it a little differently, and it was turned out funny to be funnier. So <laughs> we were all very happy about it. Was he serious when they were working on gags? Was comedy serious to Stan Laurel? Very serious, I would say serious. He, he was very funny in front of the camera, naturally, as everyone knows. But I think most comedians have a, a very private life, and they're very you know, more or less serious people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I recall that you came up to the room, uh, you rode out on the donkey yes. when they filmed the, the final sequence to the film. That's right. How did you like riding on Dinah? Oh, it was fun. She was sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Side saddled. <laughs> you chase around an awful lot during the oh, picture. Yes, <laughs> I'm always running <laughs> from the kitchen upstairs to the other rooms and everywhere, and little kitchen slavey. You were also in Pick a Star, weren't you? Yes, yes, I made Pick a Star and um, Mr. Cinderella. Uh, let me see, Nobody's Baby. And, uh, well, at 20th Century Fox, I made five or six films. And The Great Ziegfeld, I played Marilyn Miller's role. Um, and, of course, before that, little bit parts and standing. I stood in for um, Sally Eilers. I doubled for many of the stars' hands if they had to pick up a phone or pick up a card. You'd just see my hands. They were supposed to be the stars' hands. It was fun. I started when I was about eight years old. What went through your mind last night when the Sons of the Desert brought you up in front of the group and presented you with that award? I was just speechless, absolutely. Uh, it was so unexpected, and it was... I don't know, these people are so warm. It's, uh, they're such a lovely group. It's unbelievable. What goes through your mind when you watch a film like Way Out West? Sometimes I like to cringe when I see myself and I go down in my chair and cover my eyes. I think most actors and actresses feel that way. You're your own worst critic. That's true. You always say, oh, I wish I had done it this way or that way. And it's just, uh, but it, of course, it's, it's there and you can't do anything about it. And that's fine with Laurel and Hardy Buffs, Rosina. Way Out West is one of their favorites. Darla Hood Granson is your entire name. That's right. It's a real treat to meet you. Very happy to meet you and everybody else here at the convention. It's been a lot of fun. I hope you've had a good time in Chicago. Oh, it's been fantastic, and I brought my daughter, and this is the first time that she's been to Chicago, the first time she's been to a convention, and the first time she's ever seen people ask me for my autograph. So it's, it's been really interesting and exciting for her, too. So many people are interested in the Hal Roach studios and, and that kind of thing. I should mention that the first night of the convention, when all of the tents had their parade, and the Los Angeles tent, the Way Out West tent, came through, and you were dressed in a hula garb. <laughs> that kind of made it. Well, you know, it's funny. I don't really feel like I'm here entirely as a celebrity because I am a member of the Way Out West tent, and whenever they do anything, I like to just get involved in it like everybody else. So, you know, rather than just uh, walk up on the stage and whatever, I said, oh, let me do something. So the first thing I knew, they had me in a hula skirt and a flower in my hair, and, <laughs> and I was up there doing the hula. 
the, the odd thing is, uh, all of the people that we've managed to see here have uh, certainly not changed all that much. And you especially look just like you did when you were a youngster. Oh, well, I appreciate you saying that very much. And I, Darla and I get it. That's my daughter's name, too, naturally. So we've got Darla and Darla Jr. here. And uh, she's appalled when people keep saying how much we look alike because she says, at home they don't do that. She says, why are they doing it here? And I said, because, probably because they want you to look like me. You know, <laughs> she, I think she does look quite a bit like me. You know, when we stop to think, you were in the Bohemian Girl. In fact, you were the little adopted daughter that uh, wound up being babes <laughs> in that movie. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that motion picture, what it was like to work with Stan and Ollie? Okay, of course, I was very young. I wasn't six years old yet. And uh, the first thing that impressed me was the fact that uh, because I was playing Jacqueline Wells as a little girl, and she's a blonde, they had to bleach my hair for the part. And, of course, that was a big trip to me going to Westmore's and <laughs> getting all that done. And then the first time that I met uh, Babe and Stan, I, I had seen them in movies, and I was very impressed by them, and I was a little in awe of them. But they were so friendly and so warm, and uh, if you recall, there's a scene in Bohemian Girl where uh, Babe is putting me to bed and taking his longies and making him into a nightgown for me and everything. And I really felt like it was a almost like a father-daughter relationship because he was so sweet and so kind, and I was just... I just felt right at home with him. He was just a wonderful person to work with. And of course, Stan, too. He was marvelous. And he's very much like my father was. They're, they could be brothers. And so, in, in a way, he was really my favorite. But they were wonderful to work with, and they were patient with me. This was the first, uh, this was only the third movie I'd made. I'd made two of our gang comedies, and Bohemian Girl was my third movie. So I still wasn't a pro. I wasn't really with it. Um, the only amusing thing that happened didn't actually involve them. But uh, when I was supposed to be kidnapped by the gypsies, Antonio Marino and Mae Bush, uh, my mother explained to me that it was a kidnapping, but that it wasn't real. But the minute that Mae Bush threw me into the wagon and Antonio Marino was pulling a blanket over me, I panicked and I screamed and I kicked and I cried and I carried on. And we must have made, oh, I don't know, 10 takes. And finally, the director is pulling his hair out. And he said to my mother, can't you do something with this child? So she pulled me to one side, and she explained to me that it was just play acting and not to worry about it, and Mr. Marino was a wonderful man, and nobody was going to hurt me. So I calmed right down. They did the scene, and gosh, I just got in the wagon, and I smiled, and they pulled the blanket around me. The director says, wait a minute. <clears throat> this isn't going to work at all. It was better the other way because a, a kid would fight. Do you know, I, I was so enamored of Antonio Marino then, they couldn't get a thing out of me. And in the, in the movie version, I don't move a muscle. I just get in the wagon, and they put the blanket around me, and that's all they could get out of me. <laughs> One can't think of Laurel and Hardy without laughing. As Anita Garvin says, Laurel and Hardy were laughter. But they gained a love from their audience, and those who work with them, few others, if any, can claim. Della Lind explains. Oh, I had terrific fun. Laurel and Hardy were just wonderful, especially Laurel, I shouldn't say that, Stanley. Uh, we had rapport right away, and he poured out his heart to me and telling me all kinds of personal little things, and. I was very young, you know, and uh, I thought, my God, you hear it. I'm young, and he's telling me all his love stories. But uh, he cried, and uh, uh, he was just darling, and so was Oli. Oli was, they were so warm-hearted, all of them, and it was leisurely, you know. We, we, everything went, it's so, so, so effortless. And, of course, Hal Roach had something to do with it. He directed my scenes. Hal Roach did? Yes. Personally? He personally directed my scenes. Uh, the director directed everybody else's, but Hal Roach directed mine. What kind of a director was he? Was he easy to work with? Very easy. Very easy. And it came out fine. Della is a United States citizen now. In fact, she has been since the mid-40s. But she originally came to America at the tender age of 15 with her mother from her native Vienna, Austria. It may sound like a natural to cast her as the Swiss Miss, but did she have any trouble landing that role? I didn't audition at all. I was at MGM, and I was furious because I was under contract for one year, <clears throat> and I had a very active one year before that. I was 16, 15 when I started, and uh, they put me under contract, a star contract at that. I had my own parking lot, and I had my own dressing room, my own maid, my chauffeur. And I was furious with LB because he didn't put me in any picture. And when, when, he, uh, when I asked him, why can't I play a part, he said, when the right, right vehicle comes along, you will be in it. Then I saw that Hal Roach's uh, uh, 
making Swiss Miss, and I begged him to be in that. And that's how it came about, and I never regretted it. There seems to be a bond of friendship between everyone who came in contact with Stan and Babe. Not a temporary bond, but one that lasted through the years. I saw Stanley shortly before he died because we lived in the same building on Ocean Boulevard in the Oceana Hotel. And uh, we spoke to each other. I sent him flowers, but he was very vain. He didn't want to see me because he said, "Don't no, you wouldn't recognize me. He said, don't see me, maybe in a few weeks. And then he was dead. And I went to his funeral. I cried. I can imagine. The whole world did. Yeah. It was a great loss. You know, you in Swiss Miss, of course, uh, had Hardy on your love list, yes. <laughs> as it were. Was it was it fun doing that scene? You know, where the classic scene with the tuba where Stan is serenading and and Hardy's Hardy's singing the "Let Me Call You Sweetheart," isn't it? <laughs> no, it was a wonderful scene, and it was all at lip. You know, uh, they tried with the big trumpet, and it was so funny. As I said yesterday, my sisters were on the lot. And they laughed so much during all the takes that Tyler Roach said, cut, cut, cut. And then my sisters were barred for the, from the set. They weren't allowed to come back in. Mm -hmm. They laughed so much. You know, there's a, a song that you did from uh, the show called The Cricket Song. Yeah. You sang it in the movie. You sang it last night. What a warm experience that was for the whole group. That just made the evening. That and, uh, and the other one you sang, too. Well, Edelweiss. Uh, yes, I wouldn't have sung cricket because, you see, it has coloratura, which I didn't do last night. But uh, I was begged from all sides to sing it because they said, that will establish me. So I sang it, good or bad, and then Edelweiss, I shouldn't have sung because I forgot my words. <laughs> and I heard someone in the audience, that's not the right text. <laughs> <laughs> from a different motion picture, but what the heck, right? Yeah, it was fun. And, of course, the ovation I didn't expect. It was marvelous. I got, the ovation was just terrific. What a warm moment it really was. It was. It was. The audiences were so wonderful. Warmth was the key word at that convention. Everyone was glad to be there and share the good times and admiration for Laurel and Hardy. One of the biggest thrills for me was to talk to Lois Laurel Brooks and find out what it was like to have Stan as a father. Well, I didn't realize, you know, when I was really young that that he was someone that um, the world would, you know, soon adore and so forth. But uh, he, uh, I felt like I think any really normal kid did about their father. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty special. Was he home a lot or did he put in awful long hours? Well, they worked long hours and uh, my mother and father were divorced when I was six. But I did spend um, weekends and when he wasn't working a lot of time with him. I don't mean to pry into that area. I know it's been brought up. He's been married, I think, or was married six different times. Well, my mother was the first wife, and I'm the only child. And then uh, he married Virginia Ruth Laurel, and they were divorced. And he married uh, Ileana Shovelova, I believe her name was, a Russian. Then he went back and married the second one, Virginia Ruth Laurel. And then, of course, uh, his widow, Ida, is also Russian. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that she is that second Russian. And... Um, it, there was a lot of, of adverse, bad publicity about Ileana, but Ida is another Russian, and she's a very lovely lady. I'd like to think that so many people could identify with Stan and find him a very lovable type person, that he probably did have a lot of ladies who were very attracted to him. Yes, and uh, as one um, time my father mentioned, he said uh, he had a lot of hobbies, but he married them all. <laughs> How did her father and Babe Hardy get along off the screen? Well, they were very good friends and very close, but working in those days, six, like six days a week together, they needed some time with their, with their families. Uh, I can always remember birthdays and so forth. A babe would be over to our house. Um, they had different hobbies. Babe had his, uh, the track or the horse racing and the golf, where my dad had fishing and gardening. Well, that that's was, something I didn't know before. Yes, that he was interested in. But, uh, but they, yes, they were very close. And uh, when they were at Roach Studios, I think was interesting, they shot in continuity. Then when they went over to MGM and to Fox, they shot scripts like the rest of the stars in Hollywood. Uh, they would finish with all one, uh, if they say well, there's a house, for example, they would finish all the scenes around that house and go to the next. And he found he didn't like to shoot this way. He preferred the way they did it at Roach's, shooting the script in continuity. 
It was much more expensive to do that way, but I think, as he pointed out one time, if an explosion or something took place, how do you know what you're supposed to look like after an explosion if you shot it out of order? Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think in big business, how they destroy that house, I don't know whose it was, and I'm not even sure you... where the Christmas trees were... They were selling Christmas trees, and Finn Lason lived in the house, and eventually Finn Lason destroyed their car, and they destroyed his house. Uh, it was one of those shots that you couldn't have done in any other fashion, no, but in I right understand. rotation. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but um, it's, I've heard it from several different sources that in that particular um, picture that there was a someone from the Roach Studios that owned that home and they were going away on vacation so they <laughs> made arrangements for the house to be used but in on that street there were several houses that looked alike and uh, when they shot the picture and practically demolished it and when the the um, film man came back they had used the wrong house <laughs> and unfortunately that they could make the monetary <laughs> settlement uh, with uh, with the people but those people were also away that would be kind of <laughs> terrifying to come home and find your home destroyed. <laughs> and when Lois watches the films today, what goes through her mind? Well, I really enjoy them, and I see, every time I see them, I see things that I, I really missed when I saw them before. And for the, about the first five years, I, I couldn't even watch them on television. And it's only in the last uh, couple of years that I've started to go through all of the memorabilia that I have. I can imagine that because so many of the, the buffs and the sons of the desert are very, very warm toward your father and uh, find him to be a very loving person, even though we've never met him. And certainly it must, I would think, be difficult to, to watch him on screen. No, not now. As I say, the first five years, it was, I, I just couldn't. But now I realize, uh, I think my daughter put it beautifully. One Christmas, uh, it was after she was married and had their first baby, and they came home to Los Angeles for Christmas. And I think it was uh, um, Babes in Toyland they played on, and they usually pay, play that on Christmas Day or Swiss Miss. And um, she came out to the kitchen after I was picking up the dishes from breakfast, and she says, Mom, she says, aren't we lucky that we all, we'll always have Grandpa with us every Christmas? That concludes this side of this cassette. Please turn it over for a conversation with Mrs. Lucille Hardy-Price and Al Kilgore. Seal Hardy Price, what can I say, but gosh, it's great to see you. Oh, it's very sweet of you. Thanks a million. <laughs> Have you had a good time at the convention so far? Oh, it's been, a, I'm having a wonderful time. It's, uh, it's a, I've been in a constant whirlwind, <laughs> but uh, it's all so beautiful and so exciting that, yes, I'm enjoying it very much. Well, I know that you and your husband, Ben, have been whisked all around this building talking to different people, and it's, it's been a lot of fun for everybody that's come in contact with you, I know. Well, it has been for us, too. <laughs> Let me talk to you a little bit. How long have you been married to Ben? Uh, it's 18 years this, um, uh, this coming month. And uh, obviously you're very happily married. That's just evident from running into both of you. Definitely. So I, um, well, it's a very funny thing I was, that, to say this, but I mean, that it's happened that right at this time. But uh, uh, I was married to Babe very happily so, for 17 and a half years before he died. And um, it was three years, a I thought that was the end of my life, of course. Three years afterwards, why, um, I happened to, happened to meet uh, Benny. So about two or two and a half months after that, we got married. He brought me, he, he brought life back to me. Well, I'm glad he did, because you certainly deserved it. And I had a wonderful, I had a wonderful, exciting and a life with with um, being in the production and traveling and with all of the being in that business with um, uh, with Babe and associated with Babe and Stan being associated with them, wonderful life. Then on the other hand, too, 
uh, I have been with Benny, it's been a, a completely different life because it's not in the industry that I had more or less grown up in, and a very happy life with him. So, um, uh, in other words, I've been lucky twice, and some people go through life and they don't even get lucky that way once. Uh, you deserve it. I want to ask you how you met, babe. You were a, a script girl, is that right? Yes. And, um, uh, well, about in those days they called them script girl, script clerk. Nowadays people don't seem to know what a script clerk is. They call script supervisors now. But that's what I was. And I worked on one of their pictures is how we met. And then we married. I met him in July, and we married the following March. Which, uh, which picture was it? Uh, the one we met on was Flying Deuces. And... Uh Actually, your job entailed what? Just keeping track of where the shooting schedule was or their placement when the camera stopped or, or what? Uh, no, the, um, actually a script supervisor's job covered far more than that because you had to match scenes, you had to match, you watch the dialogue, keep track of any changes made in dialogue so when you moved in from a master shot, why for the close-ups to be sure the dialogue matched and also that the wardrobe matched on uh, the action, and uh, if you go back, because you know f films are very seldom shot in sequence, and uh, of course the script supervisor is the one everybody yells at, where did we leave off um, two weeks ago when we de did such and such a set? In other words, maybe they'd walk through a door and they're on another set, to be sh so to be sure they're wearing the same clothes, and if they'd been in the rain that they were, had, were wet, all of that you have to keep track of, and then also time each scene, because that was important to the director, so with its stopwatch, he timed each one. And I'd say, well, how long did that scene take? And then all of that had to be coordinated. The Flying Deuces was a story about the, the, the Foreign Legion, as I recall. Right. Was most of it shot in the studio? And in fact, was it at Hal Roach Studios? I'm trying to think if that was one of the other ones. Uh, no, that was uh, shot at the... Um, uh, by uh, the uh, Boris Morris Productions on loan from um, from um, Hal Roach. And it was shot over, I, was, I believe it was the General Service Studio. Well, it was, um, part of it was shot at, on General Service Studio and part of it was shot on the RKO, RKO lot because it was, produ it was uh, released through RKO. But um, the majority of it was shot on the set and the pool scenes and the um, the Seine River were shot at the studio pool. The scenes at the airport were taken at the um, the old Glendale Airport, which uh, was uh, long before the was the original airport for Los Angeles. It's just a little airport that's only used for private planes now. And the final scene, which uh, where a uh, babe has turned into a, a donkey at the end of the thing. That was shot out in the, uh, further out in the San Fernando Valley, out, in the, out on location. But everything else was done in the studio. After living with Babe, did you get the feeling that he was just made for movies? Uh, yes, he was. And um, it's, it's uh, strange that... Um, he, of course, he, he was disappointed in that he, uh, he originally had studied to be and hoped to be and started out to be a singer. And uh, he, he got into film work because he was fascinated by everything that had to do with the stage or, and as films came along because he got in in the very early days. And he just seemed to fall into the picture thing. But he never... Um, then he began to, to see, and he said that, um, well, he never really considered himself a, a comedian. And when he and Stan were uh, then finally teamed together, because Babe had worked in the early days with Billy West and with Larry Seaman and other c comedians, and then he was Stan, for, but uh, teamed with Stan. But he always considered himself, he thought Stan was the comedian and that he was just the straight man for Stan. Not necessarily so, though. There are so many funny moments where Babe got the laughs, for sure. Oh, definitely so. But he just had that feeling, and he uh, he depended so completely. And he would it would amaze him when people would call him a comedian because he didn't <laughs> think he would, uh, that he was a comedian. You know, it's very evident, even in the films, that uh, Babe was the gentleman, and I take it he was 
Do you remember when you first met, how it, how it happened? Did he say anything to you that maybe shocked you? I mean, here he was, a big star, and you were uh, certainly nothing less than a script girl. I don't want to put your position lower than it was, but at that particular time, Babe Hardy was just a superstar. Well, that's right, absolutely. But as far as that he, um, of course, he was always the, he was a gentleman in every sense of the word. And um, when I, the first day of shooting, when I met him on the set, why, um, uh, in the first exchange of words, I started to tell him that something of to the next scene after the master scene was coming up, and I started to tell him, I remember your gloves were in, in such and such a hand, your cane was... He said, it's all right, my dear. I know what it was. And I said, oh, <laughs> good <laughs> God, this is the most pompous person I ever met in my whole life. Was this going to be a chore? But I found out how wrong I was very quickly because... He did know he was a, was a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. and, um, no, this was in July, and um, he never made any, uh, showed any signs, whatever, of any interest. I got to be very friendly with both of them, working with them. When they finished that film, then I went to Roach with them and worked. And it was Stan that hired me to come out to follow them out to Roach because he liked my, my work on the film. And... Uh, so all of a sudden, in December, it developed that um, uh, I would be in the... I'd, I also worked with the writers on the picture. I was working on other pictures then, some of their, you know, uh, the Laurel and Hardy. I, that's the only pictures I worked on after that was Laurel and Hardy. I'd work with the writers, and then I would be in the studio early in the morning to type up what we had done to be ready as soon as the writers got their stand and the writers to start work. And Babe would start dropping in early in the morning because I'd get there way ahead of time, you know, like early in the morning before the studio was practically hardly open. And uh, uh, he would drop in and he would um, sit, uh, just sit there and pretend like he was, uh, uh, all I thought he was reading stuff I was typing. He'd pick it up and be reading it or just sit there and watch me. Or he'd order, say, would you like some coffee? And I'd say, oh, that sounds good. And he'd order some coffee from the coffee shop and sit there. So finally one morning, he started talking to me, and he said, well, um, he said, I, I don't mean to, to be uh, pushy or anything like this, and he said, uh, uh, but I just, something I just have to tell you. And he said, if, uh, he said I've known you now for, since, uh, since July, and he said something I just have to tell you. He said, I can't contain myself anymore. He said, if you would be my wife, you'd make me the happiest man in the world. Well, that gave us such a complete shock. I couldn't believe it. So anyhow, I thought it over for a few days, and I finally decided, well, I had realized I was beginning to like him more, but I didn't realize what it was, and I thought, well, I am interested. Well, anyhow, at Christmas time, he gave me engagement, my engagement ring. We went out on New Year's Eve and had our first date, and we got married March the 7th. So you were engaged before you had a date, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I told you he was always the gentleman. <laughs> Did <your> Extremely so. <laughs> Did your life change a lot after you were married? Oh, definitely, because uh, naturally he did. Uh, I had thought, well, I'd go ahead you know, with a career. He said, I don't intend for my wife to work. I thought, but uh, so I didn't work, and I found out I loved <laughs> being a housewife, as it were. <laughs> you know, you talk about the perfect gentleman. I just thought of Hog Wild, where Babe is up on the ladder, stands driving the Model T, and the ladder is leaning against the bus. Now, this was before you met Babe when right. when this was made, but uh, the ladder falls, and of course Babe is laying on the cement in front of the bus, and uh, he had just at one point, I remember, tipped his hat <laughs> to the people after the bus was to the side of the ladder. Even in the films, he came across as a gentleman and got laughs with it. Right. And that's why many of his mannerisms, like holding up his, picking up a teacup and uh, holding his finger up, well, that was a, a gesture that he picked up from his, um, his, his mother and his Aunt Susie, because being from Georgia and the southern ladies would have their tea in the afternoon, and that was the way they would, you know, hold their the polite way to drink tea, and one day he just uh, did it, and it it got a laugh in the picture. And uh, then one day he couldn't 
he got um, this he told me this was long before I knew him when he first developed these different gestures the little tie thing came from the fact that he um, he momentarily which so seldom happened with him forgot a line and but it his mind just went black all of a sudden so while he was thinking why well, he picked up his tie while he was and all of a sudden he did this <laughs> unconsciously it happened and uh, then he, and he, as he did that, he thought of the line and then went ahead with it. And he wasn't even conscious of what he had done. Well, when they looked at the rushes and then Stan said, oh, that's great, babe, you've got to put that in. Well, then he started t until it finally, he developed it as a habit and it became uh, natural with him. And that's the way many of the mannerisms developed. As we uh, mentioned during the convention and was mentioned, uh, for anybody that's listening, uh, some rumor got out and babe and Stan did not get along. That's not true at all, is it? Absolutely not. They were always the best of friends, and they were together as a team longer than any, I'm sure, and I'm sure this can be borne out by research and statistics. They were together longer than any any team that ever was and ever, ever has been in show business. And uh, it's because they each, in their work, they complemented each other. In other words, they were neither one of them jealous of the other the other party. The things that um, and lines that would that Stan would use, and things he would do, they wouldn't fit Babe's character. Babe knew it, and he didn't. And on the other hand, anything that Babe did or, or lines that he said would never fit Stan. So they're um, they're. Um, their their characterizations just blended so well together. And between pictures, although we were good friends and we would visit each other back and forth in our homes and see each other from time to time, they never had a chance to get bored with each other because they we ran with different crowds and had different friends. We belonged to the to Lakeside Golf Club, the country club, and we had our friends there. And uh, with one set group, uh, one group of friends, Stan's uh, friends were, um, well, Babe liked to live in the future. I was an, an avid reader. He'd read everything, uh, all the um, uh, uh, periodicals and keep up to date on the news. And uh, he loved um, autobiographies and, uh, and uh, things of that type historical novels and history and research books. Stan, on the other hand, liked to live in the past, and he kept himself surrounded with the old-timers in the show business. He never branched out into other fields in his private life, mm -hmm. which Babe did. And I think, too, that I th all of that helped to keep them together without any conflict of interest either in their personal life or in their uh, working life. I don't mean to get too too uh, personal here, but I, I'm wondering, like when a Laurel and Hardy film buff mm -hmm. watches Stan and Babe on screen, a certain image comes in their mind, and they think about the, the great laughs and the great moments they must have had while they're making the films. And Of course, they laugh at the funny business as well, but when you watch those films, what goes through your mind? Do you see Babe as he was in real life, or do you see Babe in just doing, well, just doing a character on, on, on the screen? No, in watching the pictures, I see him as he was on film, because he was the exact opposite in real life. He was the blustery, uh, overbearing character in his film characterization. He was the exact opposite in, uh, in real life. He was a very shy person. He was sensitive about his size and his weight. And as I said, he was always the gentleman. He, was, he loved people, and he was very, um, very, very conscious of other people's and sensitive to other people's feelings on uh, the exact opposite of what he was on the screen. As a matter of fact, I had, from the time he, well, during the time his final illness, the 11 months when he was, for 11 months and never knew whether he was going to live 15 minutes or two hours, and he lasted that way 11 months, completely paralyzed and just and nothing. And I, um, I wouldn't... Um, I never sent him, they wanted me, the doctors wanted me to send him a motion picture home and, or to a hospital. I wouldn't do it. I kept him at home, and I had nurses around the clock for him for the 11 months. 
And yeah. um, it, it, at the, from the time he took sick, I couldn't watch any of the Laurel and Hardy pictures. And after he died, I never would. After Benny and I were married, why, um, I, of course, in the meantime, I had told him that um, he had asked me, but I said I never watched their pictures. And um, they were showing the pictures quite often on TV, and if we happened to have a station on, he would go turn the minute it would come on, why, before I got into the room or when it would happen, he wouldn't even say anything. He'd just get up and turn it off. One day, the uh, Laurel and Hardy film was on. We'd been married several months by then. And he came in, I think I was in the kitchen, then he came in to me and he said, took me by the arm, he said, honey, I want to, to do something. Come in and try it. I think it'll do you good. And he took me by the arm and sat me down and he said, watch this. And I did. It's the best thing he ever did for me. <laughs> because from then on, I could watch them then and laugh. God love you. That's just a tremendous... <laughs> life that you've had together and we're certainly grateful that you could make it here to talk to the people from the sons of the desert and we do thank you for taking care of babe because he certainly provided us with many fond memories well thank you so much it's it's my pleasure and i appreciate the interest i appreciate the the devotion of the fans and uh, what has developed from the sons of the desert it was beyond the furthest uh, imagine babe or stan in in, in any sense of the word could never have imagined such a thing like this could happen, and it makes me very proud. Lucille Hardy Price at the Sons of the Desert Convention in Chicago, the first ever international convention in 1978. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Al Kilgore, I am very glad that you helped organize Sons of the Desert. Well, so am I, but I never thought it would be as big <laughs> as it is. I mean, this kind of scares you here at this convention. How many people wind up coming? I guess there's got to be about 500 people. Bigger than your wildest, wildest dreams. Yeah. Uh, as I say in that brochure there, when uh, McCabe and I were stood in the f lambs in New York City at the bar, and this whole idea came into focus, neither one of us could have ever dreamed of this. We thought it was just going to be like a, the Baker Street Irregulars, which is basically what it was founded on, you know, that kind of format, where you meet like maybe once uh, a year even. And it's just a group of professional people who have a common interest. This is the very first time that the entire group has gotten together in one location. Absolutely. And uh, it's a big, thrilling thing. You know, what can I say? Uh, it Roger really Gordon, is. Roger Gordon from Philadelphia, the Two Tars Tent, is, uh, was instrumental. And out here in Chicago, the people here did a marvelous job. I know, I know if I start naming names, you know, I'll leave somebody out and then they'll be mad. But uh, actually, uh, it, it was a lot of backbreaking work. You know, anybody that's looked through the Laurel and Hardy book has seen the back page and, of course, the insignia that you designed for Sons of the Desert, and Stan Laurel obviously gave his approval of that, and also the, of the caricatures that you did of, of Babe and Stan. Mm. How did that make you feel to get that kind of a response, and, in fact, that very nice letter that appears in the book? I thought everything after that in my life would be anticlimactic. I really did. That was the, that was the biggest thrill of my life. Uh, next to talking to Stan for the first time on a phone was a was a great, great thrill. I mean, you have no idea. It was in the, in the days uh, um, uh, when Stan was in fairly good health, you know, and it was uh, it was like a soundtrack come to life. I know in all of his letters that he signed, he wrote God Bless, and did he end his phone calls that way? Yes, he always did. It, and God Bless, as I told you before, is a, is a British exp it isn't, it's a British expression, I'm going to say, and people are going, British expression, I say that all the time. <laughs> no, it's, uh, what I mean is a British stage expression. Instead of saying, break a, break a leg when you go out to a piece of business, now there's people saying, break a leg, what are you talking about? That's an American expression, meaning do well, do good out there. And uh, God bless is the same thing in England. When you walk out onto the stage, I say, God bless. Al, what's the difference between a Laurel and Hardy fan and a buff? There is a definite difference between, a, a fan is like, you know, a person who loves blindly that their their idol can do no wrong it's the greatest thing in the world it's like elvis and they're screaming uh a buff on the other hand is someone who's a little bit more studious and does know that is aware that all idols have feet of clay you know there are like there are bad Lauren hardy films there's no question about it at tall cave yes and some of the foxes and the mgms you know so uh and and you live with that but a fan would never live with that. It's blind adulation. It's like a fan, you know, they just, 
it's the greatest no matter what, you know. And uh, that is the definite difference. And we like to think in the Sons of the Desert, most people, I would say 90% of them are buffs rather than fans. Well, that's about it. It was a convention I'll always remember. I met some of the nicest people one could ever hope to meet. Here's to Laurel and Hardy and everyone their love and humor touches. I'm Ken Behrens, and as Stan would say, God bless. bless